Bruce Ewas, UHAS. And Ryan Blaker. Employed by the city of Keene as a full-time police officer, and I've been so employed since April of 1994. Are you a certified law enforcement officer in Yes, I am. Drawing your attention to April 17th of last year, 2014, at about 2.37 in the evening, were you on duty with the police department? Yes, I was. And do you recall um, becoming involved in an investigation concerning Alan Lewis? Yes. And what did you do in furtherance of that investigation? There were two of the parking enforcement officers that provided a statement as to uh, Mr. Colson following Allen into Central Square. Uh, there was a, a trespass letter uh, prohibiting him from being in Central Square. So from that, I made an arrest warrant. Okay. And did you, uh, so you obtained a valid arrest warrant to arrest Graham Colson and for the trespass? Correct, yes. And following day, did you affect, affect that arrest warrant on Graham Colson? Yes, I did. And was that at about 11 30 in the morning? Yes. And do you recognize Graham Colson in the court here today? Yes, he's seated to the right. Will the record reflect the witness? Yes. Thank you. And um, after you arrested, or can you just describe where you arrested him? He was in the uh, alley near the 100 night shelter. Okay. And did you take him to the Keats Circuit Court for an arraignment? We went to the PD first, and from there we went to the the Circuit District Court. It was at the old location. Um, the City Hall building. Correct. And did you um, appear before Judge Burke? Yes, we did. And um, did Judge Burke set bail conditions concerning Mr. Colson? Yes, he did. Two, six, two I know it's six, six, seven, one. I'm sorry, my copy is still the bail order. Personally, how long have you been a police officer? 20 years. And over the course of those 20 years, you've probably written plenty of reports? I, yes. I imagine in, in completing those reports, you're dealing with lots of information and sometimes contradicting information, correct? Correct. Um, so as a police officer, I imagine it's important to use objective language in composing the report so as not to um, you know, sway the one witness or the one way or another. Okay. Do you recall writing a report relative to the trespass 
uh, the arrest of Mr. Colson related to a trespasser in Central Square? I wrote many reports that involved Mr. Colson. Permission to show this report to us? I'm not sure what the question is that you're going to ask. Oh. Do you have to sort of date or something you can refer to? Sure, this is um, the narrative police, for police officer Bruce J. Duhas, uh, relative to criminal trespass, reference number 139210. Is that, is that a date on it or a reference to a particular incident in there? I, I didn't know what the point is on I'm just not sure what the question is going to be. Okay. Um, in your report, um, you noted that Colson is well known as he has been following the parking enforcement officers, harassing them. Do you recall that right now? The detention is relevant, Your Honor. Um, calling attention to the, uh, drawing attention to the officer's report in this case. Um, well, he hasn't, he hasn't testified that, that, that what you're holding in your hand is the report that was incident. So. We need, need to get over that of first. Not a very high one. Okay, um, may I show this report to you? Sure. Do you recognize that to be your report? Yes, it is. Okay. I need it back. Officer Juhas drawing your attention to the first paragraph, second sentence. Colson is well known as he has been following the parking enforcement officers harassing them. Uh, did you write that? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, are you aware that um, in writing, uh, in writing that Mr. Colson is known to have been harassing parking enforcement officers? Uh, did you make any efforts to secure a warrant for the crime of harassment under the state of New Hampshire? <coughs> this is the relevance of whether he took any action based on it. How does that help me decide this case? By, um, by speaking in criminal terms about the defendant, Mr. Colson, um, it's, it's creating a, a, a bias against him um, systematically that uh, Mr. Juhas is in his report accusing him of being guilty of a crime in New Hampshire without having even made any uh, effort to whether, whether he is or isn't, how does, that, how does that bear on whether or not Mr. Colson violated the bail orders on May 4th? Well, it's relative to the circumstances that led, about, uh, that led to Mr. Colson having bail conditions of that sort. Well, to the extent that the recommendation for the no contact order came from uh, Officer Juhas at that hearing, I'll let you ask that one, one question, but that's it. Um, so, Officer Juhas, do you, uh, you were the person who inquired about having bail conditions placed upon Mr. Paulson's relative to no contact. Correct, and that it's common practice for that. It's common practice for uh, there being no contact order for witnesses of a no trespass in public? That, as well as many other cases. So um, there's no other metric for applying a no contact order beyond someone just having witnessed a, a sort of civil infraction? What's, what's the relevance of that? The only question, the question is what, what other, not what other choices were available. The question is what, what was ordered and what, whether or not your client violated what was ordered. The fact that other, other choices were there is not relevant. Good job. So you in your report, you note that you are unclear as to whether or not Mr. Colson had a valid no trespass order uh, in the square at that time, correct? I recall something to that nature. And after having checked the database, you discovered that he did in fact have a valid no trespass order. Correct. And you inquired <coughs> Mr. Dickens and Ms. John Russo. Ms. Dickens. Coffee, could you ask that question? Um, so after 
after you, you uh, found out that Mr. Gibbs, I mean, Mr. Carlson did have a no trespass order from the square, you informed the two parking enforcers about that no trespass order? I don't recall specifically how the conversation got there. There ended up being a conversation about there being the letter still valid and them still following parking enforcement officers into the square. In saying um, them still following parking enforcers into the square, uh, is it to be understood that uh, the defendant would be following the parking enforcers in the central square, perhaps? No, my word was incorrect because it specifically is for Mr. Wilson. You were aware that the no trespass order expired on May 10th of that year, correct? I don't know the specific recollection of that. Um, when you're talking about the no trespass order, you're talking about a letter of no trespass or, or a court order? There was a letter of no trespass that applied to the defendant. So you say order, it wasn't a court order, you say order. Um, so you said it is common practice in, uh, in, in witnesses to an infraction to seek a no contact order. Um, do you ever seek input from the parties to that no contact order as to whether or not they believe that should be uh, sought? Confuse me. <coughs> In inquiring with the court about a no contact order relative to a defendant and witnesses, do you inquire first with the witnesses as to whether or not they would like that to be sought? Not necessarily. If you are granted a no contact order um, between witnesses and a defendant, do you inform the witnesses of the conditions of that order? I made it clear to Alan and to Lynn after the uh, bail was completed that there was no contact, uh, that Graham was having no contact with them. Did you inform them that the prohibition on contact included a distance of In other words, that doesn't 
someone can, someone can come in and if they think that you, it happens every day, people think the restrictions are too great and they come in and they ask for relief. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. Depends on the circumstances. Officer, do you have at any point did you question the constitutional validity of the no trespass letter applying to the defendant relative to the central store? Thank you. 
about. The state's uh, demonstrated that there was a bail condition in place and that the uh, defendant violated the bail condition in the manner that was testified to by the first witness. And under the circumstances, the court finds the case has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt and finds the defendant guilty. Do you want to go to the sentencing here, or do you want to do the motions to impose next? Or do you want to proceed? Um, your, your is fine. Um, you have any preference? Um, the defense has already filed an objection to the, the state's motion to impose. Um, you have to hear the motion. I didn't know whether you wanted me to go to sentencing on this particular charge first, or you wanted me to hear the motion to impose. I would ask to hear the motion first, Your Honor. Shall I begin? Uh, just give me a second here okay. because I have that put number of files. I'd like to get the right ones in front of me. I guess what I'll, what I'll let you all know is that what I, what I would do is I would hear on the motion to impose, and then I'm going to go back and uh, I can uh, issue a sentence across the board depending on what, uh, what the court finds. We've got a motion to impose There's a 60 day sentence for the House of Correction suspended on uh, this is 12 CR 2453 Do you have the motion in front of you? Um, I have the defense's mo uh, objection to the state's motion. I don't believe I have the well, I have your objection too, but, it's, it's, but is it one motion to impose on, on three different docket numbers? Is that? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm, all, I'm only looking for one motion to yes. impose on that. Okay. Yeah, so the 60 days are concurrent. Okay. okay. <coughs> and the fines, there are two fines, and those are consecutive. Okay, all right. Motion to impose? Yes, Your Honor. The state would ask the court to impose the two fines of one hundred and fifty dollars each. I'd also ask the court to impose 30 of the 60 days. Um, as this court is aware, the state's burden in proving a motion to impose is less than um, the burden, the state's burden at a trial is by the comments of the evidence. The court has to find, essentially, enter finding a misplaced trust. I think it's clear um, he feels as though orders and rules and laws don't apply to him. There was, he was aware that he had 60 days hanging over his head on the condition of his good behavior. It was made clear from the sentence what would have to, you know, to the extent of what it would take to move to impose any of that time or the fines, including that behavior. He, I think it's clear that he has been of that behavior. He's committed the offense of criminal contempt, common law contempt, in violation of this court's order. He showed a blatant disregard for this court's order. He was, the order was issued on April 18th, and within just a couple of weeks, on May 4th, he violated it. He um, has convictions in this court for unlawful possession of alcohol on August 28th of 2012 and March 23rd of 2012. <coughs> he has a conviction for disorderly conduct in um, August of 2011. He received a sentence of 250 days, uh, excuse me, $250 fine plus a penalty assessment to pay. He was authorized by this court to um, complete 31 hours of community service. He never did that. He ended up serving seven days in jail with the fine. He was convicted in this court of possessing drug paraphernalia on August 28th of 2012. He received a sentence of $125 fine. I don't see how that's wrong in this case. case. And so you have a lawyer or an attorney or a person representing you here. They, they, they'll speak for you. And finally, on September 14th of 2012,
address the argument. Let me address the sentence on the case we just tried. Yes? Yes. And on the contempt charge, the state would ask that the court propose a sentence of six months and the House of Corrections suspended for two years upon his good behavior and a fine of $500 plus the penalty he's asking to pay. I'd also ask that the court order that Mr. Colson refrain from having any contact with Mr. Gibbons as a condition of that sentence. And what I would add in this sentencing argument is consistent with the goals and considerations in sentencing, punishment, deterrence, and rehabilitation. I think his conduct on the date that he violated the bail order was that of intimidation. I think it's clear he was trying to intimidate him. It was borderline witness tampering. He was calling a cop caller. It was a consequence for Mr. Gibbons making two reports to the police. I think he should be punished. I think his time being in prison would be a deterrent for future violations of state laws. And again, it was a blatant disregard of this court's order, and that's what this case is about. Okay. Why don't you address the recommendation on the motion to impose first and then on the sentence on the contempt case. The defense objects to the motion to impose suspended sentences for a number of reasons, one of the primary reasons being that the source of this original conviction that the state is seeking to impose was the no contact order – I mean, excuse me – the no trespass order in Central Square. The no trespass order in Central Square was since dismissed by this court as an unconstitutional violation of the defendant's due process rights when it was issued to him. At the same time that while the defendant was ignorant of the fact that this was a violation of his rights at the time, he did plead guilty to avoid the consequences of a potential jail sentence hanging over him. He did this under duress and from a state of ignorance. At the same time, he was also being charged with resisting arrest. Now, if you look to the reports of the officers in those cases, resisting arrest consisted of Mr. Colson saying no and beginning to walk away from the officers when they approached him. Mr. Colson has not demonstrated any sorts of violent or threatening behavior despite the insinuation that there may be witness tampering or intimidation by Mr. Colson that the state has made. The trespassing, of course, in Central Square is – the fact that Mr. Colson had to deal with that case was a violation of his time, energy, and rights as a whole. And to hold over him a jail sentence or to impose a jail sentence relative to that case would be a further violation of Mr. Colson's rights. Central Square – there should be no reason why anyone had been banned from Central Square for not having even been convicted of a crime. The city acted unlawfully. They began preemptively issuing no trespass orders that the courts have since dismissed as unconstitutional. And in recognizing that, it would be improper to impose a sentence relative to that on Mr. Colson. Did Mr. Colson ever ask to have the sentence reviewed or vacated for any reason? Mr. Colson was under the – is under the impression that as he remains of good behavior that the sentence would not be imposed upon him. He doesn't have access to legal resources to be challenging all of these restrictions placed upon him to his fullest extent. He's had legal representation in the past, hasn't he? Only from public defenders and people volunteering like myself to help out. But the order of March 14th also said he was going to apply for appointed counsel. Yes, he did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colson. Thank you, Mr. Gibbons. The case is taken under advisement.